All right, so there's been a lot of questions about the homework. Um, part of it's my wording. I called it a probability density function, which is its actual proper name, but our author just calls it a probability distribution function. So all I'm trying to have you do is build a probability distribution function, just like the blood problem in homework two. So, now let me change my numbers. So, draw. According to the little picture it gives you. Don't forget to start recording. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I don't want to forget again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here, why is not doing what I want to do? Well, I want to make a circle, I want to draw. There we go. <clears throat> so you have a spinner game, right? Mm -hmm. One, two, so you have a spinner that can spin one, two, and three. And then we have another spinner that can also spin one, two, and three. <clears throat> Let me get rid of my circles here and all this stuff. So this is what you're coming. So to build your PDF, you have to have an X and a P of X. Hey, Chris. Yep. Yeah. It could be a complete pain in the booty, but zoom is doing something weird for me right now and i don't know what happened i just i restarted my computer to fix it and i had you full screen and everything was fine and then all of a sudden it unfull screened itself and now the only thing i have for zoom is like the little black box where like you see your own camera yeah and i can't get the full screen back and like there's no like the thing where in like the top left where normally you'd have like your full screen button your minimize button your close button now it's just like the the zoom buttons for like hiding the um, thumbnail video, show, show sharing view, show thumbnail video and show grid video. That's the only options I have. I can't full screen it anymore and I have no idea why it's doing that. Yeah, so Mike said, use the Chrome online version of Zoom instead of the app. I don't so, have the app. <laughs> are, you on the, are you on Chrome or Safari? I may have clicked Safari by accident. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Son of a freaking biscuit. I'm sorry for being a pain. No, yeah, I had an issue yesterday putting up my videos and I didn't realize I was I loaded them through Safari and it messed up my whole video I was loading. How do I leave and then come back? I don't even have a leave button. Um, is, there way, is there a way you can like kick me out or something? I can try. I'm going to remove you and if you hopefully you can get back in. Oh, good point. Ah, oh, frick. Nope. So, no, cancel. I don't want to remove you. Um, just go to the, I uh, just, can you minimize it? No, there's no minimize button. Like those buttons don't exist all of a sudden. They're just gone and I don't and know. It, it's, take up, it's taken up the whole screen so you can't even see your Chrome. Um, it, now I pressed a button and you're gone, but I could still hear you. <laughs> all right. So just go to Chrome and try to log in and it'll automatically put it in through the Chrome app. Okay, okay. I found out. I found a leave button. I will come back. Okay. Sorry. Nope. And it happens. Okay. So back to the homework problem. So the numbers I all I really care about is in black. So it's adding, it's multiplying the spinners. So that means the outcomes I possibly can have are one, two, three, four, six, and nine. So that is my X values. I can have a one, a two, a three, a four, a six, and a nine. Now I have all these numbers, there's nine of them, but there's only one that is a nine, so that's one out of nine. There's two twos, two out of nine. And then you just do that the rest of the way and you have your PDF. That's it. That's it. Obviously you gave us numbers, right? Yeah, yeah, these, what I have in red is the start of the correct answer. Yep, these are the same numbers <laughs> from the homework. I've done half the homework problem. We just gotta finish it. Can I like take a picture of this? Like, well, take a picture of my own and send yeah. it? 
so for and do it on a PDF or a whatever. Picture like a, a screenshot and start it into the homework like this, right? Yeah, you can. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think the first part A is to find this table, and then part B is to find expected value, I think, and then maybe standard deviation. I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't have the homework in front of me no more. <clears throat> but it's very similar to the blood problem. The only difference is I gave you the outcomes already. Uh, I gave you the sample space. You have to create the outcomes uh, versus the blood problem. We actually had to do counting to find the probabilities. So this one's a little bit better once you get this table built. Any other questions on the homework? Is that the one that was just a review question? Yeah. Okay. And we should be able to do all of the homework after today, right? Of homework three, yes. Okay. Good questions. All right. So I'll leave this stuff up for a minute. Um, what we're going to need today is, and again, you don't, if you have a double way to split your screen, you can do it that way. If you cannot split your screen, then that's fine as well. Um, you can just follow along and then if you want to go back to do this later, you can. <clears throat> um, what we are going to do is use the 6.3 simulation Excel to do section 6.5 and then Sorry, the thing crashed on me. And then we'll do a little bit uh, talking about 6.6 six, and that will kind of finish out today's lesson. So, what was that? Um, you said that both of these sections aren't on the homework test, right? 6.5 and 6.6? 6.6 .6? 6 .6 is not, 6.5 is. 6.5 is? Yes. Okay. And you'll have to do 6.5 for uh, the project if you're gonna do the project. Okay. So we're talking about the project where well, I get things to load here properly and give people time to get the, the screenshot for the homework. Um, and you can just answer via chat if you want, or you can just let me know. You don't have to make the decision today. What I need to know is how many people are thinking they want to present instead of taking a final. I would like to present instead of taking a final, but I'm down with whatever the majority is, is fine. No, I mean, I'm gonna give you the option. I just need to know how many classes do I have to change? Oh, cool deal. Yeah, present. Yeah, so that's why you don't have to make a decision today. I just gotta get an idea. If a lot of people want to present, then I need to give a, uh, more than one class, but if like less than half the class wants to present, then we can do it how all How would we class. present? Yeah, present via Zoom. So could we like create a slide presentation? Yes. Yep, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So you'll get a few minutes uh, on the last day of class probably. We'll all come in and the people that want to present will get three to five minutes. They'll share their screen. So if you want to present, make sure you know how to share your screen. Um, and if you need help, you can. Uh, yeah. And then we will... Um, and then you'll present your findings. So the presentation will not take place of the lowest test grade. If you do project two, that takes the place of your lowest grade. Um, the presentation will be in replace of the final. So you can take the paper final or you can present as your final. Do you have to do the project two in order to present? Like, is there information? You do. You do. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so and that is a good question, shall we? Thank you. Um, if you are leaning to present, and that means you have to do project two as well. Um, then would it take place of a lower test grade? Yes, your project will take place of a lower test grade. And so the paper project will replace the lower test grade. And then if you present your findings, you don't have to take the final. But if you don't want to present and you don't want to do project two, then take test two and do the final. I just need to know how many people want to present so I know if I need to have one class or two classes. Right now, it looks like. I'm, I'm just going to take the final. 
Yeah. And I don't, and again, I don't need your, you don't have to be a hundred percent defined now. Um, I just need to know how many are thinking if ever, if no one wanted to present, then, then I don't have to do anything, but I have a few that want to present. So what I'll do or, um, I have to, I will put another thing up in coursework for people that want to present. I've already changed project two to a paper. So you have to do the paper, do the paper. Um, and that will replace the low, a lower test grade. And then the final is on Pearson. And if you present, then you don't have to take the final on Pearson. What would the final look like? Like it's, what would be it's on just going to be a test on Pearson or probably over chapters two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Not so much three, uh, probably two, four, six, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it'll just be on Pearson. So I will create I don't know, 15 to 17 parts or questions, however you want to count them. Um, I know I have a couple of questions of probability, probably a couple of graphs that you can distinguish between, um, a little bit of probability distribution functions, like what the homework question I have up here, uh, and then a little bit of chapters six, seven, eight. So a little bit of basically test one, test two, and a little bit of chapter two. Yes, if you want to just do the paper to replace a test grade and don't want to replace, that is fine too. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Yes, it is definitely optional. Everyone's going to take test two unless we've talked offline. So my plan is everybody takes test two. And you, you'll take test two way before project two is due. So if you take test two and you're like, yeah, I need to replace a test grade, then do project two. If you do really well on test two and you're like, okay, uh, my grade's fine the way it is. I'm done for the semester besides the final, then um, you're done. The second test will be on chapter six and seven, I am thinking. And again, we don't have to decide now as well. I'm going to get people thinking about it. Um, and we can keep talking about these things, but everybody will take test two. After test two, most of you will probably make the decision of which path you want to go. If your grade is where you like it, then all you have left to do is the final and the homeworks. So you still have to do the homework. Everyone has to do the homework. All right, so hopefully I gave everyone some time. Um, to get, I keep forgetting my, I'm on my computer, on my iPad, so it's not touch screen. <clears throat> so I'm gonna stop sharing the homework. So hopefully everybody has it that wants it. New share Excel. Share. So this is the 6.3 simulation Excel that we've kind of talked about a little bit already. Um, I've cleaned it up. If you open it, mine looks different than yours because I've deleted all the work so you can see how we go through this. So on the test, you will not have to build a plot. On the test, you just have to tell me what the plot means or what the plot is telling you, right? So the only way you're gonna have to build this graph is if you do project two. Um, so that's where you have to build it, but everybody has to be able to interpret it. And I think there's a couple homework questions on how to interpret this as well as a couple, uh, as well as gonna be on the test. So <clears throat> 6.5 is all is called assess and normality, right? And we've talked about this before. We want, um, our data to be bell-shaped, normally distributed curve, to make sure um, that it has um, a bell shape because we can't use the formulas unless we know for sure it is normally distributed. Because when we get into chapters seven, eight, and probably not gonna do nine, but if you did, we did nine. Um, to use those formulas, your data has to be normally distributed. So we have to verify that our data looks like a bell curve. So for a data to look like a bell curve, we've already done two different methods to verify that. One of them was a histogram, right? We learned that back in chapter two. We build a histogram and we want our histogram to be bell shaped. Remember though, the issue with a histogram was that if a histogram, um, can be easily skewed based off the class width you pick. So if you don't pick a properly class width, 
you could end up skewing your data, right? So another graph we learned how to build was the box plot. And the box plot was really good because it didn't have a bias. However, it didn't tell if it was normally distributed. It just told you, told you if your data was skewed or not, right? It told you if it's symmetric or if it was skewed. So basically you had to build a box plot and a histogram and make sure the two agreed with each other to actually uh, not worry about if your data was bell-shaped. This graph we're gonna learn today is going to be able to do all of that in one graph. <clears throat> so the stuff I'm going over today is going to be on this spreadsheet, part of this video. And I have posted a 6.5 and 6.6 .6 in our statistics OneNote. All right, so this is called a normal uh, quantile plot. I call it a QQ plot because that's how I learned it, and it's called a quartile quartile plot. Um, but basically, it is a graph that compares your data as the x-axis and your z-scores as the y. So we are building a we're going to build a scatter plot today. The problem is we need to create our y values. Right, we have our x values because that is our data, but you need to create your y values so that you can build the scatter plot, right? And what you want your scatter plot to look like is a line, right? And that's where people get confused with this plot. They think that it's going to look like a bell curve. It's not going to look like a bell curve. It needs to look like a line. And if it looks like a line, that means there is nothing affecting my data. There's no like biased thing out there, and therefore my data is normally distributed because we're comparing it to z-scores, which are normally distributed. <clears throat> so how do we do this? Well, I'm going to take this right out of the book. So page 278 in your book tells you how to do this by hand, which is what I'm going to do today. Even though I'm using Excel, I am doing it by hand. I am just letting Excel do my calculations for me. Page 280 in the book tells you how to just get software to do the entire process for you. right? Um, Unfortunately, Excel does not have a QQ plot function. In 280, it says it does, but you have to buy this package that costs like $200, so don't bother with that. But if you use the software package that comes with Pearson called StatCrunch, that has a QQ plot. A lot of statistical software does have a QQ plot built right into it. However, Excel does not. So we're going to use the rules on page 278 to walk us through how to do this by hand. So... What I have here is if I go back to the simulation that we kind of played around a little bit with 6.3. Remember, 6.3 was the run of simulation because I'm on my old Excel, it didn't run very good for me. So hopefully some of you played around with it a little bit. But even if you didn't, we all rolled dice for class that day and everybody rolled it 10 times. They took their average and I was making a little histogram based off your means. Well, the dice roll tab here is a simulation in Excel of 148 people that's my A, B, C, D across. Each column is a different person. And I had each person in my simulation run it, I think a thousand times, double check, yes. So every one of these columns is a person rolling a dice a thousand times. And if you rerun the simulation, if you're on a PC and you have this open, if you click F9, all these numbers will keep changing because it keeps running the simulation. Um, what I did is I copied these values in yellow. I took the mean of every single person's dice roll. So I took the average of all 10,000 uh, rolls. And then I copied that data right here. So here is the average of every single person's dice roll in the simulation. So that's where my data come from. For your project, all you have to do is put your data on a new spreadsheet. So going based off the steps on page 278 and I wrote them in much easier words in the one note. Step one, sort your data from low to high. So remember that if you want to sort your data, you just highlight it. Oh, that's what I did wrong before. I don't want to do that again. Uh, okay, undo. I messed up my thing here. <clears throat> 
there we go, highlight your data, not drag, because you drag, it replaces all the numbers. So highlight all your data. And on the sheet you have, it's priority sorted. And then hit data, and that is where the sort function is. And you can sort it from low to high. Ours is already sorted for us. So we don't have to worry about that, right? So here we start with step two, right? And I broke step two into two different parts to make it easier. So first, it says create a column of odd numbers, right? Which we are gonna call B. So my first odd number is one, followed by a three, and a, sorry, my computer, my Excel's a little slow, five, and then a seven. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a column of odd numbers so that each one of your data points gets its own odd number. So I did a few of them, so now I can do the drag down, and Excel will start counting by odds, and give every single data point its own odd number. And see, we finish out at 295, and there we go. Every data point has its own odd number. <clears throat> no repeating. Then the second part of step two, part B is, and I have written in one note, create a column for the formula B divided by 2N, where B is the odd number and N is your sample size. And I have 148 people that participated in this simulation, right? So to run, make the formula, I just put equals. My first odd number, which is one, so I'm just gonna click in the cell B3, because that's where the one is, divided by, Remember, we have to put things in parentheses so order of operations works properly. I'm gonna do two times my sample size, which is 148. Now, I'm gonna drag this down, so I want the odd numbers to change, but I don't want my sample size to change. So I can either type in the number 148, or in Excel, if you put dollar signs around things, then that tells Excel not to change that number is I want to divide every single one of these by 148. So this equation again is saying B3, which is the number one, number one divided by two times my sample size. And then I will hit enter and then it grades this number. And now I can drag this down and it will create a number for every one of my data points. And notice I end at point 9966, almost one. And I scroll back up here and I am starting out at point 003, which is close to zero. And the reason for that, column C is probabilities. Right? So these are all probabilities. Now, if we go to our Z table, these are the numbers that are inside the chart and you need to find the z-scores that correspond to all of these probabilities, which would take a long time. So we're gonna X Excel do that for us. And I have this in the notes as well on OneNote. So step three, use the function equals norms with an S inverse. You can either use the dot S or the one without the dot S, it doesn't really matter, as long as there's norms with an S inverse. And then you can see, it wants a probability. Well, the probability is the number that we just created in column C. So, I'll hit enter. And if you go to negative 2.71 on your Z table, you will find a probability approximately at the point 0 0.003. So this is skipping a single one of these numbers in the table. Now I will drag this down and I will have a z-score for every single one of my data points. Now step four says to plot these where the X values are my data. So I'm gonna highlight my data because Excel, the two things have to be next to each other to properly graph them. So I'm gonna highlight my data. I'm gonna copy it. And then I am gonna paste it. 
and then I'm going to copy my Z scores. I don't want to just paste, I'm going to paste these as values. I don't want to paste them as just regular paste because sometimes when you do the Excel, copies the formula and not the number. So I wanted to copy the number. So I'm going to copy. And I'm going to come up here and make sure I tell it to paste special. And I want it to paste as a value. So I don't want to copy the formula. In formula, I want to copy the number. Now I have all my numbers. So to do a scatter plot. Remember, this is all the way back from chapter two. If I highlight all my data, Stop, 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 too far. And then I go to charts. Now, now you're being crazy on me. Fine, insert, uh, where are we at? Are we up top, chart. Fine. I don't want a bar chart Excel. I want a different type of chart. Let me expand this out. Maybe I'm too narrow on my thing. There we go. It was just too small. I want a scatter plot without the lines. I don't want to connect the dots. Yeah. Should I scroll up first so I didn't have it all the way at the bottom? Well, let me move it this way. Command X. And B. Perfect. <clears throat> so there is my normal quantile plot so it's supposed to look like a line so if you right click on the chart you can add this thing called the tread line and it puts a line on it to kind of get an idea if this follows a line right and you can see it does fairly well we have a little bit of curvature at the beginning and the end but overall it follows a pretty good line so to make sure your data is normally distributed according to this plot you don't want more than two outliers. Now, be careful with that, because if you look at this at first, someone might say, well, this point way up here is probably an outlier, and this point down here is probably an outlier. However, remember, as long as we're in within three standard deviations, everything's okay. And you can see we're within plus or minus three, so those aren't really outliers. They're within the range according to the empirical rule. So we have a nice line here. Right, and even though we have this little bit of curvature on the ends, that's not too bad. So our data is normally distributed. So that's what you're looking for. Three things, no outliers, right? That it kind of follows a line, right? Very close to a line. Now, what you have to be careful with here is small data sets will have these little hiccups like I have in the graph right now. Remember, this is only a sample size of a 148. Typically with data, you know, you have way a lot more. So this, this statistical method works really good with large data sets. This is why on your projects, I wanted you to get at least 50 data points because right around between 30 and 50, you're at the bare minimum for this to work. Um, but it will, can still work. <clears throat> so who has to build this? If you're doing the project, you have to build a quantile plot of your data for project two. If you're not doing project two and you're just taking the test, all you have to be able to do is tell me, is the QQ plot good? Or what is the QQ plot telling me, right? And this quantile plot is telling me that my data is normally distributed, which we already knew. Because remember, the central limit theorem says, if I take a sample greater than 30, and ours is 148, and I find the same, Samples means, which is what my data is, and if I plot my sample means, they will be normally distributed. So this one should have always worked. And if you have a newer version of Excel, which most of you should if you download it from the school, if you go back to the dice roll simulation and you scroll probably to the right, I think that's where they're at. Um, must be way to the right because I don't see them yet. Remember, I have 148 people here on this thing. Holy cow, I'm gonna move this box in my way so I can scroll faster. There they are. <clears throat> Hopefully on yours, you have histograms there that look bell shaped right? Mine is not shown because my Excel is too old. Um, so, but on the school computers, it does work. That's where I ran the simulation because that's the newer version of Excel like what you all have. So going back to my QQ plot. So just to walk through the steps again, and again, they're listed in my, on page 278 
and they're also listed on the OneNote section 6566. First thing you have to do is sort your data low to high. Then create a column of odd numbers. So each data point gets its own odd number. Then in the next column, find your number's probability by using the formula B divided by 2n, where B is the odd number and n is your sample size. Step three, use the function norms inverse with the s to find the z-score that goes to that probability. In step four, make a scatter plot of your data and their z-scores and see if they form a line. Now, I am going to show you because I don't have any made up already. I'm going to go to Google, Google, because Google knows everything, and look up failed quantile plots. And I am going to share my Google results with you. And then I want to go to images. All right, can you see all these different plots? Just to make sure they're all can see what I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So if we look at this very first one, right, the middle part follows a line, but look at the tails. They drop way off. Right? So that one has failed. That data is not normally distributed. Um, the one next to it drops way off. That one also failed. You got some that are really bad, like this one here. Uh, it just doesn't say what it is a plot of. Observe values. Um, and you can see it doesn't barely touch the line at all. And then it has a tail that shoots out here to the uh, far left. Scroll down a little bit. This is a good one here on online stat book, right? You have a, I don't, know, I don't know what it looks like, but it only have two points that are on the line at all. And the very next to it is one that is good. So we have a good one right comparing to a bad one. Uh, if you have any on the test and the homework, they will be obvious that they're bad, All right? They will not be questionable. It will look something like this where it's failed horribly. Another one to kind of pay attention to is this one over here, right? Um, notice it looks like steps. So I have two data points next to each other. Well, actually three, three data points, two data points, some ones, two. This kind of looks like it's falling the line, but it, the reason it's so bad, this is discrete data. And I can tell it's discrete because all of the data points are lined up. And we already know our discrete data cannot be normally distributed. So therefore, this fails, and I can tell just by how it looks that it's discrete data and not um, continuous. Because to be normal, you have to be a continuous data set. So any questions on what you're looking for to see if a quartile plot shows your data is normally distributed or not. No. Uh, so in, you said that it would be on the homework. On the homework, will it be kind of like the, just for us to identify it again? Yes, it'll be, it should be already built for you. Okay, so we don't have to, the only time we will have to build our own is for the project. Correct. Okay, and, all right. And like Mike asked, um, the data in step one is the data from project one, yes. You don't have to find the means. Mine was of the means, but you are gonna build a quartile plot of your data from project one. Okay, all right, and then if you, so if your histogram was skewed to begin with, cause I'm gonna be like, for mine, I wanted to compare the data. So like okay. if mine was skewed to begin with, would this just support the fact that it's in, yes. like the, uh, not a normal distribution? Yep. Yeah. So you should get the same conclusion as you did in project one when you told most of you told me if your data was normally distributed or not, if you're looking at a bell curve. So you should come up to the same conclusion in project two. Now okay. saying that, what you will talk about in your project is because your data is not normally distributed, the calculations that you have done may not be uh, statistically significant or statistically accurate. The formulas will work and I still want you to do the calculations. I don't want anyone to start over with a new project, right? Just even if your data is bad, just go through the steps so that I can see you know how to do it and just realize that your results, you would have to do some kind of other statistical analysis because your data is not normally distributed. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep. 
So what I want to do now, I'm going to go to my, off the, my OneNote. If no one has any other questions then. And bring up section 6.6. Six. So section 6.6, six, six, I talk about it because it's part of the course. Um, but it is something that's not, it's not really used anymore uh, in analysis. It was really useful. Sorry? Uh, I have all the chapters listed in my OneNote, but if I go to click on them and look at your notes, there's like nothing in them. Really? Yeah. So you click on chapter five, and it doesn't show section 5152 and 53? Up until chapter five has them all, but after chapter five, there's nothing. You probably have to download it again if you download them because I just put chapter six in. Oh, okay. And I've only put one section in. The other chapters I didn't put anything in, I posted it all on our course page. Um, so on our course page, it has chapters six, seven, eight, and 10. I will probably get them built on my OneNote, but I haven't had a chance yet. But I did add six, five to six, six on here. Um, just to make sure everybody, because I don't know if I need to change my screen, everybody can see my OneNote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm making sure when I change screens that uh, Zoom is keeping up with me. Okay, so here's, like I said, here's the steps again um, of what we just went through and what you're looking for. So in 6.6, uh, it's about using the normal to solve a binomial problem. Right, and the reason for this is before technology, doing the binomial was not fun. And most of you could probably agree with that as you did the binomial by hand for the test. So doing the binomial by hand is not fun. And if you have a large sample size or a large trial set, doing the binomial by hand is even worse. So there is a procedure to take a binomial and be able to estimate the answer by using the normal. And this also works for Poisson, but we're just going to go into binomial today. Now, there is some requirements you have to check before you can do this, right? So a little bit of refresher from Chapter 5, right? If I have a binomial problem, there's those four rules, right? They must be, the trials must be independent. The trials must be success or failure. The probability of success must remain the same. No, I forgot. Oh, and you must know how many trials you're doing, right? There's the four rules of binomial. Again, independent, success or failure, probability of success remains the same, and you must know how many times you're doing it. And if something is binomial, remember, the mean is n times p, or n is your trials, p is the probability of success. And then to find standard deviation, that is the square root of NPQ, where N is your trials, P is the probability of success, and Q is the probability of failure. Now, before I can do this little estimation, I have to meet some requirements. So requirement number one must be binomial. Requirement number two, if I do N times P, which gives me the mean, it has to be greater than or equal to five. All right, and then if I do n times q, that also has to be greater than or equal to five. Some authors use 10, um, but we will kind of stick to greater than or equal to five. I'm going to erase my notes from yesterday real quick. I forgot to clean that up before today's class. All right, I can draw. <clears throat> So that we have to verify that requirement. And then we have to do this other step, which is called a continuity correction, right? Remember binomial is discrete and a normal distribution is continuous. So we're trying to take a discrete problem and make it continuous. So to do that, I want to adjust my X value. And my X, remember, is what I am looking for, what's in probability and statistics we call our event. So to adjust our X value, we are either gonna add or subtract 
0.5. So I am gonna take something that is a whole number and I'm gonna force it to be a decimal, All right? And so on page 287 in your book, it has this table that I put in OneNote, right? And it has written out way more words, but I've simplified the words down again. If it is an at least problem or greater than or equal to problem, I have to subtract 0 0.5 from my X. If it is a more than problem, I add 0.5. At most, add 0.5, less than, subtract 0.5, <laughs> sorry, exactly, means I have to do a between problem. Now, yeah. go ahead. I just said bless you. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know this table, I'm going to be honest. I draw air, and by drawing the picture, I always know what to do. So, let's do an example. If I have a binomial problem where I have done 100 trials and the probability of success is 40%, right? Um, and we'll say, I don't know what has a low, this lower percentage, the probability that we're back to normal by summer. So I ask 100 people and 40% of them say, nope, we won't be back to normal by summer. So there's our binomial problem. Now, I can try to make this a normal distribution, right? So first thing I have to do is check my requirements. Well, I already said it's binomial, so we'll say requirement is check. Do requirement two, I have to do n times p. Well, 100 times 0.4 is 40, which is greater than five, so that requirement is met. And remember, that is also my mean value. So this will be my mu. Now, I also got to check my failure rate. So I do n times my failure. So n times 0.6, 100 times 0.6 gives me 60, which is also greater than five. So I have met the second requirement. I have met the first requirement. So now I can use the normal distribution to answer this question instead of the binomial. So before I can do normal, I need to find my mean. And the mean of a binomial is n times p, which gives me my 0.4, I mean, sorry, my 40. And then I have to find my standard deviation. So square root of 100 times 0.4 times 0.6, which gives me 4.9. So if I draw my bell curve, just like we've been doing previously in the class, right? I am centered at 40. And I have a standard deviation of 4.9. And now I could say, what is the probability that my uh, event is greater than 43, right? So what is the probability that 43 people or more agree with that summer is not going to be back to normal, right? So. I put my 43 in here, draw my line. I am doing greater than or equal to, so I color to the right. Uh, where did you get the 43? It's, I, it would be part of the problem. Oh, okay. So you're it'll be, it'll, yeah, it'll be, the, it'll be the question I asked. So where I got it from is right here. But if it was a scenario, I'll be like, what is the probability at, uh, at least 43 people believe the summer is not going to be back to normal. Okay, so you have to give that to us. Yeah, yeah. It'll be right now in the problem. Because So this is, the, the 40 is my mean, 43 is my X, and my standard deviation is 4.9. However, I can't use 43, right? Remember, I have to, use, to apply the continuity correction. So going on the table, anything that's greater than or equal to, I subtract 0.5, right? Well, if I just think about this minute logically, right? If I add 0.5, now I have taken off this little piece right here that I don't want to take away. That's part of the answer, right? So it's better to go backwards 
and add a little bit more because then at least I'm not excluding someone that should be included. So that's how I always like to look. I can just draw a picture and see which way I want to go. I never want to go into the shaded region. I always want to go away from the shaded region. So my new X value is going to be not 43, but 42.5. All right, so that's the little, that's the extra crazy step you have to do to do what the book calls a continuity correction. Now, instead of finding the probability X is greater than 43, I want to find the probability X is greater than or equal to 42.5. So step one, just like we've been doing in chapter six, draw a picture. Step two, calculate my Z score. Remember Z equals X minus mu all over sigma. So my x is 42.5, my mu is 40, I divide by 4.9, and I get 0 0.51. So now step three, I go to my table, and I find 0 0.51. So I go find my table, 0 0.51 gives me 0 0.6950. All right, am I done? Why? You're correct, Ben, but why, what, I have to do an extra step. Why? What is it called? You, you have to use the, the uh, opposite. Oh. Yeah, there you go. I'm fine with that, too. Yeah, yeah, you have to do the opposite, right? Because we're colored the wrong way. So I actually have to do one more step in this case, because I colored the wrong way. 1 minus 0 0.695. Zero, which gives me a final answer of zero point, I think three zero five zero. I could be wrong. I tried to do the math in my head. Sounds right to me. Yeah, it looks right too. Good. So the probability of getting greater than or equal to forty two point five is 30.5, 0 .30, 0 0.30, 0.3050, or 30.5 percent, right? Now, my numbers over here are a little bit different because I use technology, right? So the technology gives me 0 0.6951, uh, so it gives me a 0 0.3049, but remember, we only rolled to one decimal place, so we get the exact same answer. Now, the whole point of me saying no one does this anymore, right? Because if I use technology to use the bin do the binomial of the original problem without doing any of these steps, I get an answer of 30.3033. So there is a little bit of a difference here, right? The actual answer is 30.3033. My estimated answer is 0 0.3049. So this is my estimate. This is the actual. But the whole reason we have this is if we didn't have technology and you wanted to do the binomial by hand, then because it's a greater than equal than problem, I would have to find the probability that x equals 43 in that formula, plus the probability that x equals 44 in the formula, plus 45, plus 46, dot, 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 all the way up to 100. I would have to do that formula 57 times and then add it together. So this is why this concept was designed, was to allow us not to do it 57 times, but to only have to do it, I'll, I'll say five, because you had to actually recalculate this too. So five, in five steps, I could estimate the answer, or 57 steps to find the actual answer. Now, however, with technology today, you can go into Excel and put binomial disk and solve this problem in 
one second. TI-84 calculators can solve this problem. All kinds of statistical software can solve this problem. So no one ever uses the normal to estimate uh, the binomial anymore because we can find the binomial. And that, that's why I'd rather have you all take the time and understand what's going on and not worry so much about how to do the calculations because in the real world, you're not going to do any calculations, right? You're going to be Thanks. doing what you're doing here. Um, you And a lot of you should, I hope, have gained a little bit of appreciation for this course just based on what we're dealing with right now with the coronavirus, right? This curve they keep talking about is the normal distribution. Making predictions and when life can go back to normal, they're using statistical analysis to try to make predictions, right? So everything you're learning in class, our leaders and doctors are all trying to use statistics right now to figure out, you know, what's the best scenario to do besides just do nothing, right? So everything we're learning in this class is being applied in our lives on a daily basis right now. Uh, and, in, and decisions are truly affecting our, the results. So that, that's what I really like everyone to take away from all of this. Um, so, but for today's lesson, get me back on track. Uh, this section was just kind of going through and seeing a different way to solve things by, if you had to do things by hand, that's the only purpose of 6.6. .6. There will be no problems on the test like 6.6 because .6, if there was, then you could just use technology and solve it with binomial and not have to do any of this anyway. And I've already tested you on binomial on test one. So I'm not putting it on test two. Um, 6.5, it's a good idea to be able to build a plot if you, or you have to build if you're building a project. But again, what I really want you to be able to do is interpret the charts, right? Because most of you are not gonna do the analysis, but just like you're seeing on the news, they keep putting up all these charts and a lot of people are just relying on the people in the news to tell you what the charts mean. And sometimes the people in the news do a really good job. And sometimes the people in the news do not do a really good job. So it would be beneficial if you knew how to read the charts so you can make your own informed decision of what to do. So that's the big key takeaway from 6.5. And in all of that, that finishes out chapter six. So to me, we're getting into the fun stuff now in chapters seven and eight and nine and 10. Uh, we'll run out of time before we can finish them all. But we're finally doing statistical analysis starting next week. We have laid the foundation and now we can actually start to interpret some results. I implore you. It's not. It, it's not bad. Um, you must know your symbols, though. So yeah. if you don't have the chart I gave you last week down, make sure you know where you can find it quickly, right? Because if you take your little pullout right now and go to chapter seven and eight, because that's going to be the next two big things. There is really no numbers in any of those formulas. Some of them have a little two, and sometimes the two is actually a number, and sometimes it's not. So that's the challenging part of statistics. If you don't know what all those symbols are, and the only symbol you should not know what it means right now is the big E. Every other one of those symbols, well, in the T. The T, the E, and this little funky-looking X. But you all should know what P hat is. Definitely know what P is. You definitely know what N, Q, X bar, S, Sigma, Z, right? These are all things we've talked about for quite a few weeks now. If you still are confused by these symbols, then you're not going to know what to use these formulas for. So please, by Monday, I don't remember what day it was, um, either know what your symbol sheet is so you can look at it, because that is going to make sure you put the number in the formula in the right place. Chapter 7 and 8 is literally just putting numbers into formulas and solving. But you have to put the numbers in the correct order. And that's, that's the hard part of statistical analysis. So I want to make sure um, that you know your symbols. And if you use technology, and uh, not really, technology is not going to save you either. So yeah, we're going to have to go through these formulas. So I will spend Monday, I'm going to start chapter seven, and we're going to talk about what a confidence interval is. And then probably Wednesday, we'll get into practice of calculating them. Because I want to make sure you know what it is before we spend a bunch of time calculating. All right, so we still have 30 minutes left for questions, comments, concerns. I'm all yours. And if you have downloaded my OneNote, you can, you're going to